Hey guys, let's get going with the Ironman 70.3 Gulf Coast course info, tips and tricks, and Q&A. Speaking of Q&A, several of you guys have already submitted your questions in advance. Um, if you have a question now or if something comes up uh, through the presentation, you can submit those via the GoToWebinar widget there. There's a questions tab, so just enter your question there. I will get to as many of those as I can within our allotted time. I know you guys are tapering triathletes and sleep is critical, so the last thing I want to do is keep you up past your bedtime. So if I'm unable to get to your question here this evening, I will respond to you via email. Um, hopefully tomorrow, if not, it will be uh, in the next couple of days. So you get an answer uh, in plenty of time before, before headed into the race. My name is John Mayfield. I am a full-time triathlon coach. This is what I do. I have the privilege of uh, having this be my job, my career, working with athletes. Uh, I am certified by both USA Triathlon uh, at level two, as well as Ironman U. And I've had the privilege of coaching hundreds of athletes from first timers to elites and professionals and everyone in between. Uh, I will also say that uh, Panama City Beach is uh, one of my favorite race venues. Uh, I've had lots of special memories there, both as an athlete and coaching athletes. Uh, I really love the Panama City Beach area. So you guys are in for a uh, in for a treat. So uh, as you head out there to the PCB, a couple tips to uh, take care of as race day approaches. I always recommend checking in early. So uh, you do have the option in a 70.3 to check in the day before. If that's all you can do, uh, then that's fine. But I, I would say check in as early as possible. If you're headed in a couple days early, go ahead and get that knocked out so you can move on to, to other things. It is going to be critical that you stay hydrated. Uh, so May on the Gulf Coast is, is pretty much summer. It's going to be hot. It's uh, likely going to be humid. Uh, the sun will probably be out. So uh, there, there's lots of things that are going to be working against your hydration levels. And it is going to be critical that you maintain uh, good levels of hydration uh, in, leading into the race, as well as during the race. If you get behind on hydration at any point, it's going to be very difficult to get it back. And it's impossible to perform at peak if you are not well hydrated. So my recommendation in the days leading into the race um, even the, especially the day before, as you're down there again, checking your bike, doing all those things that you have to do before the race. I, I always recommend just having a, a water bottle, uh, nearby, preferably with some electrolytes in it and just constantly be sipping on that bottle throughout the day. Just being cognizant of the fact that, um, even if you're not sweating heavily, you're, you're still losing hydration out here in this, uh, more tropical environment. Um, so the last thing you want to do is start the race behind on hydration. So, um, stay hydrated in the days leading in. Uh, and then race morning, same thing. You're starting to work on those hydration levels and then really make sure you prioritize staying hydrated, um, uh, during, during the race. We'll talk more about that, um, in a few minutes, uh, uh kind of similar, uh, limit time on your feet. Again, there's, there's so many cool things, uh, to do in Panama city beach. It's a great family, uh, va vacation spot. So again, just a ton of really cool things, uh, to do, but, uh, it, it is important to, to somewhat limit the amount of time you're spending on your feet walking around. You really want to save those legs for, for race day. So if possible, uh, you know, some of those, those things, the, the shopping, the experiences, um, maybe you do those after the race and, and maybe spend your time just, uh, uh sitting on the beach, uh, in the days leading into it, just to, to rest up, uh, be sure to read the athlete guide full of information, good stuff, especially if you've not done, uh, either a 70.3 or even this particular, uh, race, good information there to know, uh, there's, there's always a nugget or two that's, that's really critical, um, in those. So be sure, uh, to check out the athlete guide. So maybe that's what you're doing, sitting on the beach, uh, there reading the athlete guide, making sure you have everything set and ready to go. All right. Race morning. The water temperature will be announced. Um, it's generally posted uh, down there in the Ironman Village uh, in the days leading into the race, but uh, this is one of the frequent things the announcer will be saying on race morning. They'll be telling you exactly what that water temperature is and what that means. So um, historically, it's kind of been all over the place. It's been uh, above the cutoff. It's been below the cutoff. So I, I would say be prepared both ways. Um, so as of today, uh, the, the buoy down there at the pier is showing 73 degrees. Uh, it is wetsuit legal up to 76.1. So that means all age group athletes can, can wear a wetsuit without any kind of, of penalty or, um, 
being disqualified from awards or a world championship slot. So again, below 76.1, uh, actually I believe it's at 76.1 or below it is wetsuit legal. Um, so again, today, uh, 73 degrees. So we've got, uh, a few degrees to, to go with assuming that, uh, the, the Ironman, uh, reading is similar to, um, that buoy out there by the pier, um, is, is consistent. Now, uh, last year, water temperature was 77.4 in 2021, uh, 71.6. So again, in 22, uh, it was above that, that cutoff. So it was what we refer to as wetsuit optional, where you can still wear a wetsuit, but, uh, you will go, uh, enter into the water last behind all the people that are not wearing wetsuits and you are not eligible for age group awards or world championship slots. You're still a finisher. You still get the medal still counts as a finish, just not eligible for awards. Um, if you choose to wear a wetsuit over that, uh, 76.1 degree cutoff, um, uh, excuse me, 76.1. I was looking at uh, that next one. So 2021, 76, 71.6, uh, 2019, 78.6. So again, uh, currently looks like we're below, uh, the cutoff and then it's almost every other year. So, uh, m maybe if things work out, it'll be wetsuit legal this year, but, uh, that, that doesn't look great for it for next year. So if, if that trend continues kind of every other year, but again, um, pay attention to, to the water in the days leading into the race. Um, and, and you'll have a pretty good feel there. I've seen it swing, uh, oddly, obviously this is the Gulf of Mexico. It's a huge body of water. Um, but I have seen some, some decent fluctuations in the water temperature, um, leading into races. So even if it is again, 73 today, that doesn't mean it's going to stay below 76, um, by, by race day. So again, uh, I always say have a plan, know what you're going to do. Um, if it is, if it stays at 73 degrees, what does that mean for you? Are you going to wear a sleeve suit, sleeveless suit? Are you going to wear, uh, something like a swim skin or, or nothing at all, uh, other than just your, your kit, um, or, if, if it does uh, increase and the water temperature is over uh, 76.1, where it's now wetsuit optional, are you going to wear a wetsuit? Are you going to start uh, further back? And um, again, I, I would always recommend making that decision today. So you're not having to think about that on race morning. It's just a, it's a decision that's already made and you simply execute based on what you've already uh, thought through um in the days leading into the race. Uh, parking is limited uh, down there in the area. There's also some uh, places you want to make sure that you're not parking illegally. I uh, definitely don't want to go and uh, go and race 70.3 miles and come back and find your, your car has been towed or ticketed. Um, but uh, check the athlete guide for, for those designated areas. And uh, getting down there a little bit earlier will make it a little easier to, to find you a good parking spot. Speaking of, transition opens at 4.30. So make sure that... Uh, your alarm clock, breakfast, everything you need to prep uh, before leaving uh, your, your accommodations, um, travel time down there to the race site, getting parked, um, and then doing everything that you need to do before the race. Plenty of time uh, for that 5.40 a.m. start time. Um, it's just so uh, Panama City Beach is is basically um, the the far eastern border of central time. Um, so the sunrise is is very early um, and I've seen some early starts to some races out there, but I don't think I've ever seen a race start before 6 a.m. Um, so uh, it's, it's going to be an early start. So, again, just make sure that uh, you've, you've got the alarm set with plenty of time uh, to, to do everything you need to do, get down to the race, get set up and have a great day. So the swim start is uh, fairly simple. It is a self-seated rolling start with a beach entry, not a whole lot to it. So uh, once you have everything set up in your transition, you'll move down uh, onto the beach and what we'll have there are uh, signs that basically um, will uh, show what those expected swim times are. So you will line up uh, according to your expected swim time. So, uh, I believe it's, it's five minute increments. So it's something like 25 minutes and below, um, is, is the fastest. And then every five minutes from there, uh, all the way back. So, uh, you'll know exactly where you need to, to queue up. And then once the race starts, uh, they will be releasing multiple people, uh, usually somewhere three to five people, uh, every couple seconds into the water. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a beach. So it is a beach entry. You'll start up on the uh, shore and as they, they, uh, let you go, uh, you'll, you'll head into, uh, head into that amazing, uh, Gulf coast water. 
So a couple tips for the swim start. Uh, get cute early. Again, I, I'm going to say do everything early. Uh, it's It just works better that way when, when you do that. Um, they will sometimes have those... Um, those cues in, uh, in corrals. So, uh, those corrals fill up and get, uh, real crowded. So if you're trying to get up towards the front and you enter at the back, it's going to be difficult to work your way through hundreds of other people who got there early. Um, so recommendation is to, uh, get everything set up early, head down to the beach, get queued up. And that way you can get focused and, uh, start, uh, thinking about your day. Don't queue slower than expected. So um, this is sometimes, uh, especially the, the more nervous ones, they say, well, I may be swimming in 45 minutes, but I'm going to go like with the 60 minute group. That can often be a mistake. So I would not recommend doing that. Definitely uh, get lined up uh, in your, what, what you think you're going to do. And that's going to help you uh, produce your best swim. You're going to have less, uh, less people swimming over you. You're going to be swimming over fewer people, less contact, all that when you're swimming with those people that uh, are going to be a similar pace to you. Don't panic. Uh, I know this is easier said than done. Uh, oftentimes there's nothing we can do about this, but uh, if you are one that is subject to uh, panic attacks in, in open water, um, there's a couple things that we can do. Uh, leading into the race, uh, the great thing about here is, is uh, you're, you're down there on the beach and you can access the swim course at any time. Uh, so definitely recommend um, getting in some some time in the water uh, as race day approaches and uh, just spend some time out there. Uh, get used to being in this water. Um, I always recommend what we call sink downs. So that is where basically you just go underwater, exhale, get used to that feeling of exhaling underwater and then come back up and uh, remember that there's air right above the, the surface of the water. So just spend a little bit of time there. And then if something happens during the race, kind of same thing, just collect yourself, um, wave to the support staff. If, if needed, they'll come get you. You can hang on to uh, a boat or a kayak, whatever they have out there um, and collect yourself and get going from there. So not a whole lot to the swim course. Uh, it starts uh, right outside that uh, Tower 3, swims out um, approximately half a mile. Uh, there is a red turn buoy that will then turn you um, to, to the northwest. You'll go through another turn buoy and head back uh, to, to the shore. So not a whole lot to this. Again, it's just two turn buoys, and uh, it's um, pretty simple. Not going to get lost or anything like that. Nothing too complicated here so far as the course itself is actually laid out. So a couple tips for the swim course, consider the sunrise when choosing your goggles. So uh, that sunrise is going to be uh, over your, your left shoulder uh, for um, the, the way out. Um, and then of course, over your right shoulder on the way back. So uh, regardless of whether you're a left breather, right breather, bilateral, at some point uh, you're, you're gonna be getting uh, that, that sunrise. So again, very early start, 5.40 in the morning, that sun is barely gonna be peeking over that horizon. Um, so take that into consideration. If you are up, uh, that early before six o'clock in the days leading into the race, uh, just pay attention to where, where the sun is on the horizon and what the implications there are. So, uh, generally recommend a, um, kind of, kind of, I would say a, a mid, um, level goggle, goggle, not real dark, but not clear. Uh, this, this water is gorgeous. It's beautiful. It's, uh, it's almost crystal clear, but it is still, um, it is still uh, open water. So um, even though we want to have some tent uh, to, to help with the sun, we also want to have plenty of visibility so you can still sight well uh, in, this, in this open water. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the waves and the breakers. The, it, it's a bit of an unknown. Um, if there are waves uh, and breakers, they are going to be closer to the shore. So keep in mind, like where people surf, they're not surfing a half mile out where you guys are going to be making that uh, turn around that turn buoy. Uh, the surf is right up there uh, at, at the near the shore. And so basically that's where the waves are the biggest. Just get through that and there will be uh, calmer water past that. So, um, there's a couple different ways to get through this. A lot of times, um, we'll see is with these beach starts, athletes will want to, uh, kind of wade in for a long period of time. They'll get up to their, their waist or even deeper. Um, they'll, they'll wait and, uh, kind of just take, uh, those waves as they come, turn their back. Um, but again, you're on the clock here. So, um, you're going to be more efficient 
uh, swimming through uh, through this section as opposed to trying to wade through it, walk through it. Um, so start swimming uh, early on. And uh, the, the best, most efficient thing to do is go under the wave. So this is probably the same thing you did as a kid or if you're traveling with your family, your kids are going to be doing, out, doing it out there in the days leading into uh, the race. But you can even do uh, what they refer to as a dolphin dive where you're going down um, in the shallower part. You can grab sand and uh, that can... Uh, you can, you can use that to pull and project yourself, um, back up under that wave. But the most efficient thing to do, uh, when, when, and if there are those larger waves is to go underneath them, swim again. If you see, uh, that next wave coming, try to go up underneath it. So generally pretty easy to do, maybe practice it in the day before the race. Uh, if, if that opportunity is there, uh, from there, so far as execution goes, uh, I always, I always, for me, uh, want to break things down into simple, manageable segments. So how do you eat the elephant? One bite at a time. So we have this whole race, and then we have this 1.2-mile swim course. So how do we approach it? Um, for me, in, in a swim like this, it's uh, each section at a time. So my objective when I enter the water is just to make it to that first turn buoy. Once I reach that first turn, turn buoy, I'm now headed to the second turn buoy. And then from there, uh, I, I'm, I'm kind of in that home stretch and just making it uh, to that uh, swim exit. So break it down into a little bit more manageable um, parts. You'll have some little victories along the way, uh, and, and that will help it uh, from, from seeming so daunting. So not necessarily racing 70.3 miles or even swimming 1.2 miles. It's just swimming from, from the beach to that red turn buoy and then section by section. Sight often. Um, so the, the important thing to do is swim straight. Uh, you'll really um, be inefficient with your time if you swim additional yardage because you're swimming crooked. And again, depending on uh, the, the condition of the seas, this, is be, uh, this may be easier or, or more difficult uh, according to that. But sighting often will ensure that you are swimming that straight line, shortest distance between two points. Um, so um, it's also going to be important to match your stroke to the water conditions. So what I mean by that is um, if, uh, if uh, hopefully uh, you have some really nice flat, calm seas, which is, I, I would say, kind of the default for Panama City Beach. It's, it's not a surf haven. Uh, it's no one goes there to, to surf simply because oftentimes there is no surf. It's, it almost looks more like a lake um, than, than an ocean. So that's what we're hoping for is just a nice flat, calm day. And there you can have a longer, smoother, uh, stroke, uh, more of what we would consider that traditional pool swim with, uh, kind of the glide on the front, nice and long. Um, but, uh, if there are stronger currents, if there's chop, if there are waves, uh, it's going to be important that, uh, you increase your stroke rate. Uh, basically any dead spots or, or even, uh, slower spots in your stroke are going to make you more susceptible to the currents and to the waves. You could even pull you backwards. So, um, a little bit higher turnover rate. We want to keep good technique, but basically we're just increasing, uh, the rate that, uh, we are, are turning. Same thing like on your bike, it would be a faster cadence. So, uh, what we're looking to to do there is um, increase the amount of time that we're we have that underwater pool so that we are always producing forward progress in the water. So um, and that's kind of the, the rougher the water, the faster uh, it's going to be. So we still want to maintain good technique. We don't want to. Uh, it's not it's not you know spinning out of control, uh, but it's just a little bit faster. Just making sure that uh, we don't have any slow spots or dead spots in that swim stroke. And then upon the exit, keep swimming until you touch sand. So this is something to, uh, you know, you're, you're probably tired of swimming at this point. You're thinking about going and, and transitioning and hopping onto the bike. But uh, kind of like I mentioned before, it's very inefficient to walk or try to run through water. Uh, it is much more efficient to swim up on top of the water. So keep doing that until you can't do it anymore. So that rule of thumb for me is, is I always swim until my hand touches the bottom. Um, and then at that point, I will go ahead and stand up and um, uh, head into the transition area. Keep in mind that uh, this is a little different. You've been horizontal for a period of time. Uh, you've been doing some odd breathing, odd uh, turning of your head. Oftentimes uh, your equilibrium may be a little bit off. Um, so just kind of collect yourself and uh, safely navigate across the beach and enjoy the swim. Uh, this is really a, a neat swim course. Um, it, it, again, the water is usually uh, very pretty, very clear. You can see a lot in it, um, and it really makes for a, a great swim. So make sure to um, enjoy that. 
So a tale of two C's, as I mentioned, um, the kind of the default, what we can expect what the chamber of commerce wants to tell us is, uh, this picture here on the left is a typical day in, in Panama city beach. And again, I I've, I've been fortunate to spend a decent amount of time, uh, there at the beach. And I'll say, uh, this is pretty indicative of what we see a whole lot of the time. Uh, this picture on the right, uh, is, is pretty popular. It's been making its uh, way around the, the internets, uh, for, for several years. This was actually from Ironman Florida. So this was not, um, in, in the spring slash summer, this was a, a fall picture. Um, and you know, it's, it shows where, what, what can be, um, possible out there. Um, I actually was in this race, so um, I, um, I I can speak to the uh, possibility of surviving a, a rough day. And kind of like I said before, uh, I will say the pictures were really worse than the the conditions. Again, those waves uh, are, are going to be bigger, and they're going to be breaking. Uh, they're pretty close to to shore. So the important thing is to just keep in mind there's going to be uh, smoother, calmer water back behind these waves. So get through them, um, and then. Uh, you'll, you'll be good. And then the benefit is you get to ride them, uh, coming back in. So, uh, it's kind of like going uphill or, or facing a headwind at some point, you're going to turn around and get to go back downhill or, or enjoy a tailwind. So, uh, that's, that's gonna actually going to make for uh, a nice fast, uh, segment coming back if, if there is, but, but again, uh, generally pretty flat and you can see there on the left, it, it really looks a lot more like a lake, um, than, than a beach. All right. After the swim, we're going to head into the transition area. So uh, you'll come across the beach, come through uh, the the hotel rows there. Uh, your your transition area will be set up where you uh, dropped off your bike and got everything set up um, the morning of. A couple of tips for transition: be efficient uh, and impact minimally. I think these kind of go together. Uh, we, we don't want to spend more time than necessary in the transition area. Uh, we also don't want to interfere with any of the uh, other athletes that are around us. So uh, it's good to be efficient and pack minimally. So um, packing minimally, minimally kind of helps you set up with that uh, efficiency. So uh, always recommend practicing in advance, knowing exactly what your transition protocol is. For me, when I set up, I have my helmet um, set up on on my bars. If it's If it's not too windy, uh, on my bike. So, uh, it's, it's in such a way that all I have to do, I have the straps, um, open wide and I have it where all I have to do is pick it up and put it on my head. It's the right direction. I don't have to spin it around. I just pick it up, put it on my head, uh, buckle the buckle. Keep in mind that, um, the, the rules do require that your helmet be buckled anytime your bike is off the rack. So make sure you have that helmet buckled um, prior to taking your bike off the rack, and then you're not unbuckling your helmet prior to re-racking your bike afterwards. We see that um, quite a bit. Oftentimes, uh, athletes will forget or uh, just think that, you know, uh, I'll, I'll do it before I hop on. Go ahead and do it as you're putting your helmet on. Get it out of the way. That's one of those uh, efficient things. You're already there. You're already touching those straps. Just go ahead um, and buckle it so you don't have to mess with it later. And then from there, whatever else you need to do uh, to, to get out onto the, the bike course. Uh, consider a go bottle. Uh, this is one of my favorite tips. Um, so um, you've been out there on the swim. You've been exerting a certain amount of energy. And uh, hopefully you haven't taken in too much salt water. Um, but uh, you have been, again, getting behind on hydration. You've been burning electrolytes, burning calories as you're out there. You're going to need all of those. Uh, as you head out onto the bike and then to the run. So uh, what, what I do in a 70.3 or uh, even an Ironman race is I start run with a go bottle. So um, per personally, I like uh, vitamin water. So that's usually what I sip on uh, in the days leading into the race. And those bottles, um, I believe they're 16 ounces or, or so, um, but they have a nice big mouth on them. So uh, you can actually pour quite quickly. Your standard water bottle is a smaller opening. So it, it doesn't pour quite, um, as quick. So I save one of those vitamin water bottles, my T1 go bottle. I put about six ounces of, of water in there. Uh, I do a serving of, of my nutrition. So I'm getting some calories. I do a serving of electrolytes so that I'm getting hydration, nutrition, and electrolytes all kind of shotgun there, uh, in the transition area. So I can start off, uh, well primed and again. It's been a certain amount of time since I, I left the transition area. I threw away my bottle and I was spending time on the beach, went out and swam. Um, so I'm already getting behind. So that go bottle it's, it's just real quick. I'll grab that, chug down those six ounces or so of, of water. And so I'm getting hydration, calories, electrolytes, all before I go out. It just takes 
a, a very few seconds to, to hit that bottle. Um, and then I'm off headed out onto the bike course. So not a whole lot to this bike course. Uh, it's actually going to, um, change terrain environment pretty quick as you get across, um, across the intercoastal, get away from the beach. It actually turns into a, a really pretty, uh, kind of, kind of strangely heavily wooded pine forest area. Um, and it, it actually, there is a little bit of elevation. It's not, um, it, it's known for being a flat course and, and kind of depends on what your definition is. Um, but, uh, it's a nice course. It's a fast course and, uh, you're, you're going to enjoy it. So, uh, you're going to start here on the beach, obviously starts off headed to the West. And then a couple miles in, you'll uh, head up to the north where uh, about half the course is this out and back. So uh, if you have have raced or going to be racing uh, Ironman Florida, this is kind of where you're starting a lot of the same roads uh, that Ironman Florida is is on. So this first stretch here coming up uh, around mile 10, uh, that's where you're going to cross the, the intercoastal. That's where that large uh, bridges. And, and I would say probably half the elevation of the whole course is getting across this bridge. Uh, from there, you will continue up to the north till approximately mile 20, uh, you turn and come back down. Um, if you are flying into the, uh, Florida beaches airport, uh, it is actually right here. So as you leave the airport and, uh, hop on this road, which this is actually part of the Ironman Florida course, uh, head into this road, you'll actually get to see, uh, part of that. If you really wanted to, not a bad idea. I would say, uh, go, go check out this stretch of road, um, on your way into, into town. So again, you'll make that U-turn, you'll head back, cross back over the bridge, um, and then do this jaunt out here. So, uh, generally good roads. Um, it's there, there are some stretches that, that are a little bit rougher than other, but, uh, I wouldn't say there are any bad roads. Uh, but, but again, some are nice and smooth. Some are, are, are mediocre. Okay. But, uh, nothing that I recall or I'm aware of that, uh, to, to really be aware of as far as any, uh, dangers or, or bad roads out there. It is going to be exposed to the wind and, uh, to a very certain extent, the, the sun as well. So take those, uh, into consideration, uh, is, uh, it is a slight uphill when you are headed North, uh, the further North you go, um, the, the more you're going to, to feel that now, uh, the, the stretch that is, um, has a little bit hillier, more elevation gain, uh, is, is further to the North. So if you're doing, or if you've done Ironman Florida, uh, you'll be spending more time on that section, a little bit further North where, where there is a little bit of elevation gain, but again, pretty flat, but, uh, it is going to be a net uphill as you are headed out and then a net downhill as you're headed back towards the coast. So kind of makes sense. Uh, also, uh, anything can happen. I've seen it both ways, but we would expect, uh, the wind to be blowing off of the, off the water. Um, Certainly, uh, it, it can blow from the north, but especially this time of year, we would expect more wind coming off of the coast. So uh, you know, it's going to be a, a tailwind as you are out and a headwind as you're um, coming back. So uh, be careful around the Publix and the U-turn. So uh, some some kind of interesting uh, little little tweaks to this course. And uh, my understanding is that these are are done to um, reduce the the traffic backup and and keep cyclists away uh, from the car. So what you'll do as you head west, and this is this is both around this uh, mile forty five stretch. Uh, right, right in this area. So you'll approach this uh, Publix grocery store. Uh, if you're not from the area, Publix is one of the big grocery stores in Florida. I, I think they're a pretty good store. Uh, so if you need anything in the days uh, leading into the race, check out uh, Publix. So um, basically what you will do is come in and make this uh, right turn, uh, stay on the, the side of, of the parking lot, and you'll head back behind the grocery store. Uh, so yeah, this is back where all the uh, shipping containers and the dumpster and all that. Uh, it's it's kind of different uh, back there. Uh, you'll come around uh, the store and then exit out of the park uh, uh, parking lot this way. So basically, uh, you know, they expect a lot of traffic, a lot of cars turning into uh, the grocery store. We want those people to still be able to go get their groceries. So uh, instead of having uh, this stretch where uh, there'd be a lot of traffic, those cars having to wait to make that right turn or, uh, God forbid, uh, uh Inner, inner uh, locking with with an athlete, uh, they basically take you around the store. So it still allows uh, ingress and egress for the vehicles, the cars to get in out of the uh, grocery store parking lot. 
From there, you'll head out and cross over this little body of water, uh, which is where you're going to approach uh, the U-turn. So kind of same thing. Instead of having you come, and there, there is a nice U-turn lane here, but um, in years past when they didn't have this, uh, that, that caused a, a huge backup of, of vehicles. So what they have you do now is this kind of uh, figure eight-ish loop uh, around. And what is most interesting here uh, is that this stretch right here is actually not a path. Um, so there, there is a clearing through here. Um, and, and basically what they do is they have uh, large, almost look like puzzle pieces, but they're probably six foot by six foot thick plastic. Uh, they're, they're like you would see on a construction site if they're doing uh, road construction or something like that where they need a stable base. Um, where uh, it, it is, um, they're, they're plastic. Um, so I would say here, especially if, um, if it get wet, uh, they're going to be very, very slick. Now you're going to be making a 90 degree right turn into this. It, it is a downhill. Uh, so you're coming here from, from the road headed down, um, and then making also a pretty tight 90 degree turn at the bottom. So be very, very careful here, obviously up out of the arrow position on your brakes, feathering your back brake. You don't want to overdo the front brake, especially when going downhill, uh, that can lead you to tumping over the bars. So just be real careful through this stretch. Um, again, pretty tight 90 degree turn downhill on some plastic, uh, big Lego pieces, we'll call them. Uh, and then another 90 degree turn onto a bike path. So, um, this is maybe double, maybe a little bit bigger, uh, than, than the side of like a standard sidewalk. Um, so this is not a, a road. This is more of a path, uh, for walking and, and more like cruiser bike kind of things. Uh, you come under here, cross under the road, back up. This is a, a park area and that will put you back on uh, this side of the road where you can head back and then uh, ride that final stretch uh, back into the transition area. So a couple tips for the bike course. Uh, settle in uh, those first few miles. So again, uh, you're going to head out of transition to the west and these first five miles or so you're going to be riding along the coast. And, and basically this is a stretch of a few hotels, but like high rise condo, one after another, after another. So, um, you're, you'll be riding along there. Chances are there'll be some wind on your left side as you head out. Uh, but settle in, you know, you've, you've gone through that swim course. Uh, you've, you've gone through uh, transition. Your heart rate may still be a little bit up. Um, and obviously you don't want to overdo it. So, so just kind of settle in, find yourself in those first, uh, however many you need, it may only need you, you may need a mile or two, you may need more. Uh, but hopefully by about that five mile mark, you're starting to settle in um, and you can really get down to um, your race pace, your, your, and your, um, your hydration, nutrition, electrolyte protocols, and uh, go from there. Uh, prepare for the wind. Um, you know, you're right there on the beach. It's, it's generally uh, pretty windy. So, um, and again, we, we would generally expect that out of the South. Uh, so chances are you're going to have a tailwind out, headwind back and, just be prepared for that. Uh, know that if you are just cruising and, and every, the day feels super easy as, as you're headed to the North, know that, uh, uh, if it's easier than it should, uh, you probably have a pretty good, um, tailwind and, uh, know that just that, that stretch coming back is going to be more, more difficult. So, um, make sure, especially, uh, I, mean, I know I'm harping on this, but uh, it, it, depending on how strong that wind is, it may be difficult to get in your hydration and nutrition, if, especially if, if the, the stronger the wind, the more um, apprehensive you may be about reaching uh, for, for bottles and that sort of thing, taking aid from an aid station. Um, so as you are uh, enjoying that, uh, that tailwind, make sure that uh, you're even getting ahead a little bit on that nutrition and hydration, uh, just in case on the way back, um, you may not be doing it as frequently um, and, and vice versa. If you have a headwind to the north and then you make that uh, U-turn at the 20 mile mark, uh, make sure you get caught up uh, as you are cruising back with, uh, with the tailwind. And then uh, once you uh, head, head past, uh, you make the, you go around the grocery store and make the U-turn, uh, begin to prepare for the run. So I would say somewhere um, around the pier, uh, this is going to be probably around, 
51 miles, about five miles to go. Uh, this is the, the pier and finish line for, for Ironman Florida, if you're familiar with that area. Um, again, about five miles out. So for most, that's give or take 15 minutes. Um, I recommend stop taking in nutrition. Uh, <laughs> I know I've, 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 I'm now speaking out of both sides of my mouth. But what we don't want to do is, is overload the stomach in those last couple of miles where you're headed into transition and starting the run. Um, with your stomach sloshing with too much in it. So my rule of thumb is about five miles out. Um, I, I will stop taking in nutrition. Uh, and if I get that, that thirsty sensation, I'll just do kind of a rinse out. Um, but from there, I'm starting to think about the, the run. What am I doing in transition? What is my transition protocol? Uh, what, what is my, my pace and all that? Um, and then backing off a little bit uh, as far as the power goes and, and sometimes even increasing um, the cadence, depending on how my legs feel, especially if it's been a windy day. If it was, uh, if I was fighting wind out there the whole time, my legs are going to be tired. So I'm going to back off um, my, my power just a little bit and uh, increase my cadence just to kind of spin out the legs, get them ready to, to run. So whatever your run cadence is, it's, it's a good idea in that last, uh, those last couple miles to match that cadence to just, again, teach your brain, um, that, uh, you know, I want my, I want my feet, uh, turning over at, uh, maybe 90 steps per minute. So a cadence of, of 90 on the bike is, is going to begin to, uh, program your body and remind, uh, remind yourself of that. So, uh, just, just prep in those last couple miles and, uh, be ready to head into transition. So, uh, if this looks familiar, it's, uh, it's for good reason. Um, same tips for transition two as transition one. Uh, be efficient, pack minimally, practice in advance, and consider a go bottle. So the one thing I will do here, uh, a little bit different in T2 than T1, is uh, I will have just a little bit more in that bottle. So um, basically, I, I have to take the T1 bottle in transition. I don't, I don't have a way to, to carry that out on my bike. Um, so it's, it's less where I can just kind of take it all in, in one big shot. Um, I'll do more like 12 ounces, uh, in my, my T2 bottle and kind of depending on how I'm feeling, I may just chug 12 ounces. And, and, um, I know I just said that we don't want to overload the stomach with, with fluids, but, um, again, it kind of depends on how I feel. Oftentimes I'll, I'll take some of that, uh, and then I'll carry that bottle with me for the first who, who knows how long I, I've carried them for up to two or three miles before, where if, if my stomach was a little bit off, uh, and I didn't feel like taking in a whole bunch of fluid, I, I just took in what I could, um, that, that is what I do. So, um, having that, um, having that extra, uh, hydration there, same thing We're we're jump starting our, our hydration, nutrition, um, and, and electrolytes there in, in T2. So going to be, um, definitely critical as we head out onto the run course, so just a good idea to, to practice that, uh, that go bottle. All right, headed out on to the run course. It is a three loop course. Uh, it is, um, pancake flat, uh, with the exception of the little, uh, uh, pedestrian bridge that, uh, you'll start, uh, on. So you, you start and finish there, uh, with, with that pedestrian bridge. So, uh, other than the very beginning and the very end, uh, it's, it's pretty pancake flat. So not a whole lot, uh, to it. Um, it is pretty much fully exposed to the sun. Um, so one, it's going to very likely be hot and, uh, also something to consider if, uh, you're, you're like me and, and susceptible to, to sunburns and that sort of thing. So you'll definitely want to, uh, take that into consideration, both from a um, core temperature regulation standpoint, as well as your um, skin protection. So tips for the run course. Um, I, I like these multi-loop courses, especially a three-loop. Some people don't like them. They get uh, get kind of bored, get dizzy running in all those circles. For me, they allow for a, a good strategic approach to the run. So uh, kind of like the bike, we want to aim for a negative split with each loop. So uh, kind of my rule of thumb is my first loop of a three loop course is uh, restrained. It should feel like um, I, I really want to go faster, but I'm just kind of checking things out. I'm confirming that my body feels good. I don't want to overdo it. So my first loop is, is intentionally, uh, held back restraint. I'm running, um, maybe anywhere from 15 to even 30 seconds per mile slower, especially, uh, in the, in the first mile or two, uh, you, you may come out there having done those, those, uh, higher cadence and, and you may feel golden, 
uh, out of transition. Be careful because sometimes that can be deceptive. A lot of times uh, you're, you're feeling great out of transition, but it'll catch up to you real early if you overdo it. So if you're feeling great out of transition, that's fantastic. But um, you've got a long way to go. You've got a lot of miles to prove how fantastic that uh, you're feeling. So recommendation is to start reserved, start restrained, and then build. So Again, that, that first loop is anywhere from 15 to 30 seconds uh, slower uh, for me. And then kind of depending on how I feel that second loop, I'm going to uh, run that kind of more of kind of what was my goal pace. Um, and again, based on how I feel, I may uh, build early in the loop. I may build a little bit later in the loop. And then on that third loop uh, now, uh, you've only got four miles to go. And in there, it's kind of that smoke them if you got them, let it hang out. And if you've paced well and um, used your energy well, you can really go out and uh, run this last lap at a uh, as your fastest loop. Uh, there are not a whole lot of people that are going to do that. Not a whole lot are going to be able to do that. And really, it requires good um, strategy so far as your pacing goes. And again, you absolutely have to keep up with your hydration, your nutrition, your electrolytes, all those, but you nail all those things. And that last lap is going to be your fastest. It's going to be the most fun. And you're going to be passing people left and right, uh, really bumping up, uh, checking off folks in your age group, um, that way. So, uh, as I mentioned, critical to stay hydrated and stay cool. Um, you may not feel this as much on the bike, especially on a, a windy day. Uh, it's you're, you're, you will be hot, but you don't necessarily feel it as much. There's that ambient cooling, uh, from riding at give or take 20 miles an hour. You got the wind blowing on you. Um, and there's, uh, with that convection, you're, you're losing heat, uh, because you are moving through air. You have air moving over your body at a rapid rate. So to an extent, when you're out there on the bike, you're, you have an advantage so far as cooling goes. Uh, also you're not expending as much energy on, on the bike. Once you get out on the run, now you're going to be moving significantly slower and you're going to be using more energy. So that means more heat from the outside, more heat from the inside. So it is critical that you maintain your core temperature and you stay cool. If and when your core temperature begins to elevate, there is an inverse relationship in what you are able to do so far as performance. The higher your core temperature goes, the less you're able to perform. So if you are out there and you feel like it's just really hard to run, you really need to, to walk. And when you start to run again, uh, you're having a really hard time sustaining that run. Chances are uh, your, your core temperature is, is elevated and you need to get cooled back off. Now, the problem is uh, it actually is, is difficult to get that core temperature back down quickly once it begins to rise. So that is why it is so important to stay ahead of it. Um, and hydration, electrolytes uh, is, is a big part of that. So uh, playing into that, I also recommend taking something from every aid station. So um, maybe it's your nutrition, maybe it's a gel, maybe it's a piece of fruit, a pretzel, whatever, they're, they're big old buffets. Um, but uh, maybe you're not due for that. Maybe uh, your, your protocol, like, like for me, when, when I race uh, a 70.3 or Ironman, I take a gel every other aid station. Um, but on that, uh, that aid station where I'm not taking a gel, I'm still going to take something. I paid a whole bunch of money uh, to be in this race. I'm going to get my money's worth. So uh, if nothing else, it's a cup of cold water that I'm going to pour over my head. Uh, it's going to be a cup of ice that I am going to uh, pour down uh, the front of my kit, the back of my kit, down my shorts, uh, get that ice all over the place. Just again, trying to uh, cool the, the body from the outside, help regulate uh, that core temperature. And then same thing, uh, we want to uh, help mitigate the, the core temperature from the inside. Uh, I'll take that ice, chew on it, um, and, and get that cold water down again, looking to, to cool the, cool the body from the inside as well as the outside. So take something from every aid station, plan those in advance, especially kind of in the heat of battle. Uh, it can be kind of hard to say, you know, did I take a gel at that last aid station? Am I due for, for this? Um, as you are approaching those aid stations, think through that. And this is kind of another advantage of these multi-loop courses. So um, that's something to pay attention to as you're running the first loop at that restrained, uh, held back pace. Where are these aid stations? And uh, that way in your second and third loop, as you're beginning to push and uh, you're, you're kind of getting into uh, your, your um, 
you're getting tired, your, your glycogen stores and all that are beginning to get depleted. Uh, you'll know exactly where uh, those, those little bit of relief are going to be. It'll give you something to look forward to. Uh, and then it also provide that sustenance that you need. So pay attention on that first loop, know exactly where they are. And then uh, when you're running that second and third loop, you'll say, yeah, I know there's an aid station right around this corner. Uh, from there, I can splash some cold water on my face and I can get down um, some, some Gatorade or some water, whatever, whatever it is that you're taking. Um, and, and if nothing else that can become your strategy is getting from aid station to aid station as you, uh, make that loop feed on the energy. Uh, again, there's just something about Panama city beach that uh, has a really neat feel, great crowd support, uh, for this, this race. A lot of the locals, uh, turn out that it's always well attended, uh, by families. So, um, take advantage of, of that and, um, really enjoy, um, enjoy the process. And then I always recommend, um, helping your fellow athletes. So, uh, I always say we're in this together. Uh, even you see, uh, folks at the height of competition, uh, they're, they're working together too. Uh, there's, there's a spirit of camaraderie among triathletes and, uh, especially if things aren't going, uh, as expected, if you're not having your best day, what I have found is that if I can invest in someone else, if I can help someone else, that really gives me purpose in continuing to push and continuing to fight for everything. But uh, even if you're having the, the best day set in a PR, uh, it's, it's still great. And that's going to really give you that fuel to keep going when you uh, uh, help somebody out. So maybe it's just a, a word of encouragement. Uh, you know, maybe it's uh, a, passing them a, a cup of water as you go through the aid station, whatever it is, uh, just uh, work, work together and be a positive light out there on the run course. So uh, you will do that run course three times. You'll head back across the pedestrian bridge around the hotel and then on to the finish. So uh, here's just a practical tip. Uh, clean up. So uh, you, you've perhaps uh, got your, your jersey unzipped and, and uh, sponges and, and wet towels shoved everywhere. Uh, your sunglasses are probably crooked and hats on backwards. But uh, you've, you've done battle, but now the battle is over. So um this is where you're going to get your, your finisher picked. It's going to be your Facebook, Instagram profile for the next uh, couple months. So uh, clean up, zip up, wipe your nose, um, and uh, look good for those finish line photos. Uh, plan your finish. So, uh, you know, especially if, if you're one, this is your first time, um, enjoy it. Uh, it's, it's a lot of fun, especially once you step into that finishing shoot onto that red carpet. Uh, take it all in. Um, find some space, uh, again, especially for, for the first timers, I would say, uh, let it be yours. Uh, y this may even be slowing down a little bit to, to kind of let, uh, let that shoot clear out and then enjoy that finish line, take it in for, for yourself. Uh, just, a, again, a practical tip here. Uh, I, I see this several times throughout the year at these events. Um, you have to finish the race, cross that finish line by yourself. I, I see uh, every once in a while, someone will hand off a, a kid or a baby. Uh, you're immediately disqualified if you cross the finish line with uh, with a child, a pet, anything like that. So just, just a point of reference, make sure that you're crossing that finish line by yourself. And for me, it's all the high fives. There are lots of, lots of folks, lots of kids that uh, are, are there to support you. They, they got their, their hands out. And uh, for me, it's all about giving out those high fives at the end of the race. All right. So that is what I have got. Uh, we'll now move on to the questions down to just uh, a few minutes here. Uh, again, I want to be respectful of, of your time. Uh, any questions that, that come up, um, I, I'm more than happy to, to address, answer your questions. Uh, shoot me an email. The address is john at tribe And, uh, I'll get back to you. So um, again, just a couple minutes here. I'll get through as many of these as, as I can. Um, so uh, what do I cite on the swim? Yeah, good question here. Uh, normally what we're doing uh, in these open water swims is looking for um, something beyond uh, the course, you know, like a, a building or a mountain or something like that. Um, you know, in this one, I'm not quite sure what uh, is is there to the south, especially on that first stretch. I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's Cuba or or uh, somewhere, some Caribbean island, Mexico. I'm, I'm not exactly sure, uh, but you can't see it. Um, so especially as you are in that first stretch, as you're headed south, there's not going to be anything on the horizon. So it's going to be real important to to side off the buoys. Um, so uh, with this the rolling start, it should be relatively easy to to stay close. 
to those buoys. And uh, just kind of a tip here, um, the, the rules say you have to go around the red turn buoys. So um, those, um, they're usually like yellow on the way out and orange on the way back. Um, that, that can change, but only those two turn buoys, um, those 90 degree turns are the ones you actually have to go around. Now they're going to say, uh, keep the buoys on your right and, and the, the safety crew out there on the, the boats and paddle boards and all that, they may be pushing you back to the left, but you actually can swim to the right of those buoys. If that is where, uh, you feel safe and comfortable and you can get uh, a good sight, uh, and swim that straight line, obviously you would want to stay pretty close to the buoys. We don't want to get way inside. Um, especially as we approach the, the turn buoy, that's going to increase the, the amount of distance you have to go to swim around the turn buoy. Um, but yeah, if you want to, um, hug the buoys just inside, um, the buoys, and then, and then obviously we want to go around and complete that turn on those two turns. Uh, that, that is fine as well, but, uh, especially on the way out and then on your 90 degree turn, as you were headed back kind of to the, the Northwest, um, direction, uh, it's going to be critical that you sight off those buoys. So that's going to be a little lower. Um, they're, they're pretty big. Um, obviously, uh, as you're horizontal there in the water should be able to see them. Okay. And then, uh, once you, you make that second turn, you're headed back to the beach, there will now be some more opportunities, uh, to, to sight off the horizon. So, uh, there will be, uh, the inflatable, uh, swim exit. That is probably more, um, like the second half, uh, that, that would be a good sighting object. Um, you have the towers in the back, the hotel there, uh, those are good. So again, basically just find whatever it is, uh, that works for you. But, but on the way out, you're going to be pretty limited to, to buoys. And if, um, if the seas are, are a little bit rough, so I did Ironman Florida back, uh, last fall, uh, it, they weren't terrible, but, uh, there, there were some swells and, uh, that actually made it more difficult to sight because oftentimes I would look up to, to see that buoy, but there would be a swell, uh, in front of me blocking, uh, the buoy. So again, uh, I would just kind of have to try to time it a little bit better. And, uh, so if, if there are some swells, if the sea is moving a little bit, um, when you're on top of one of those swells, take that opportunity now to, to peek up and make sure that you're still online with those buoys. Any tips for riding in the wind? Um, yeah, so we talked about this uh, a little bit, um, especially with the the nutrition. Um, do what's comfortable for you. Take this into consideration when you're making your wheel selection. Um, I, I get the question a lot: Is it safe to to ride a disc? And and almost without exception, I always say yes uh, to to the disc. Um, getting a little off topic here, but um, the the disc is uh, going to be. Uh, majority of your weight is on the back of the bike, uh, and your rear wheel isn't hinged. So it, as a rule, that disc isn't going to, to cause, cause problems. What is more of a risk is that front wheel. So again, you've, you've got probably 30% of your weight over the front wheel and it's hinged. So it's going to be much more susceptible to, to crosswinds. So I would say that the depth of your front wheel is a bit bigger consideration than, than the rear. So, um, if it is predicted to be a windy day, I would say if you have that disc wheel or, or a, a deeper wheel, go ahead and put it in the back, but, um, go with a, a, a thinner wheel up front that, uh, isn't going to catch, uh, quite as, quite as much wind. But, um, so before the race, uh, just take those things into consideration and I would say, uh, just be safe. Uh, I think that's the biggest thing is, um, obviously we're, we're not quite as stable when we are in the air position in the crosswinds, uh, we're tucked in, we don't have as wide as a stance, um, and, and there's just less to, to hold on to. So, um, do what is safe for you, do what is comfortable, um, if, if you are not comfortable, you're not safe to, to yourself or the other cyclist around you. Um, so obviously we don't want to cause any issues. So it may mean sitting up, uh, same thing, depending on how strong that wind is, uh, you be very, very careful when doing things like reaching for bottles. If you have a bottle, uh, on your, your, um, on your frame or behind you, uh, there's, there's increased danger there. Same thing as you're going through aid stations. If you're taking bottle handoff, something like that, obviously just be careful, um, with the wind and then, um, you know, do what you can to mitigate the wind. So, um, if you're comfortable, uh, stay in that lower arrow position, stay down. Um, and then I, I'll say here with this big out and back, um, it, it gives and takes away. I'll say that. Uh, so if you've got, uh, that tailwind to start, know that you're going to pay for it, uh, with a headwind or, or vice versa. If you're fighting a, a headwind on the way out, just know that you're going to have a, a nice tailwind, uh, on the way back. And then again, um, 
it, it can always shift. So you never know quite what to expect, but uh, just stay patient and, and be safe. Will there be a pre-swim warm-up? Um, from recollection, I, I do believe that uh, athletes are allowed in the water. Uh, it's kind of hard to uh, uh, police it too much because, again, it's just an open beach. And, and obviously, um, in the days leading into the race, obviously, you can go down and, and walk into that water at any point. So, again, definitely recommend uh, getting acclimated and, and familiar with the water in the days prior. Um, if that is something that you need a, a swim warm up, uh, it's, it's definitely not a bad idea to get in there, uh, feel exactly what, uh, the conditions are, um, and that sort of thing. You know, good idea. Uh, get down there early, get in your practice swim, get queued up and, uh, have a great race. Are there any hills on the course? Um, not really. Uh, you know, we, we talked about this before too. Um, the, the biggest hill quote unquote is, is that bridge that goes over the, the intercoastal, uh, right there, uh, at, uh, it's about mile 10 on the way out. I forget, uh, I'm guessing mile 40 or so would be my guess on the way back. Um, it's not particularly steep. It's not particularly long. It's kind of fun. Uh, you'll, you'll get a nice fast, uh, descent off the back. Again, be careful there. There are some, uh, expansion joints on that bridge. Uh, so just kind of be careful as you're going across those, make sure that, uh, your, your tire doesn't fall down, um, in there. But, uh, again, uh, if, if you've done Ironman Florida, the, the Hills, so to speak, are, are further North. So not a ton of elevation here other than, uh, other than that bridge that you'll do, uh, on the way out and the way back. <clears throat> are there bike and run gear bags? Uh, no, not for this race. This is a, um, traditional transition area where you'll have everything set up there, uh, at, at your bike, you'll come in transition. Everything will be there, uh, either on your bike or, or on the ground, um, around it. Um, all right. Getting close on time. One more, um, any last minute tips? Um, you know, I, I'll say this, and this is probably one of my, one of my favorite tips for, for any race is, um, in the days as the race approaches, day before, two days out, spend some time uh, thanking your support crew. Um, very few triathletes are uh, in this solely by themselves. Most have uh, a spouse, a partner, kids, coaches, uh, training partners, someone uh, or, or many people that have been there along the way to, to help them um, and allow it, picking up the slack, uh, all those things that allow us to go in and do this. And, and they are a key integral part role of what we do. We couldn't do what we do without them. So, um, I always advise spending a few minutes in the days before a race, uh, just saying thank you, uh, expressing that gratitude, uh, to that support crew, and then having, carrying that spirit of gratitude with you into the race. So uh, inevitably when the race gets hard, you'll be thinking back to those people. You'll be thinking about your family. You'll be thinking about your training partners. Uh, and uh, it's just a really great um, thing to know that you expressed your gratitude to them. They know you're thankful. They know exactly how you feel. Uh, that again, is going to fuel you, fuel you um, late in the race when the, when the race gets tough. So again, just take Take a couple minutes, um, say thank you, and uh, show your appreciation to your support group. All right, there are a couple more questions. Again, I, I'm going to follow up to these um, in in the next couple of days. Thank you uh, for those questions. Thank you for turning out tonight. Again, uh, if any questions come up from here, feel free to to reach out. I, I, I'm I'm happy to help. Email is there on the screen. John at tribetriathlon.net. All right, guys. Have a great evening. I uh, want to wish you all the best in your race. Good luck and uh, have a great race.